Hello all, and welcome to ICC for the recap of the final match of the American Cup, which is a tournament that has been going on for the past couple of weeks in St. Louis. And it features some of the best American players, and they have tried a very unique format, which I have not seen attempted in a chess tournament before. It's the double elimination knockout. So it's not a Swiss, it's not a round robin, it's a knockout, but it's a double elimination which means you have to lose two matches in order to get eliminated from the tournament. So the way it works is the main bracket, they play a, a two-game classical match and playoffs if necessary. And then the losers go into the elimination bracket in which they play a two-game rapid match. And if you lose from there, then you are eliminated from the tournament for good. So it's a very unique format and... Uh, it produces some really exciting chess, so it was nice to have that variety in a strong tournament like this. And the other um, thing that I want to mention that was uh, pretty cool about this tournament in particular is the time control. They used a sudden death time control, so it was just game 90 with a 30 second increment from move 1. There was no extra time after move 40, and that produced some very exciting um, time trouble, especially as the game went uh, on and on. So um, the match I'm going to show you today is the finals of of the main group, and it was between Fabiano Carana and Levan Aronian. So one thing you should keep in mind here is that Aronian had already lost one match previously in the event, and he had fought his way through the elimination bracket. So the thing with the double elimination format is that since Aronian has already lost a match and Caruana has not, he just went straight through um, winning all of his matches, that means that they're going to play a two-game classical match, which I'll show you. And if Caruana wins uh, this match, then he wins the tournament because he, he won every match. But if Aronian wins this match, then he does not win the tournament right there because he already lost a match. And you have to remember that to get eliminated from the tournament, you have to lose two matches. So if Carano wins, it's over. But if Aronian wins, then these same two players move on to a rapid match, which will uh, be final, and that will determine the champion. So just keep that in mind, because right now I'm going to show you the classical match, and Aronian needs to win this match in order to force a rapid match. That's kind of the the appeal of the double elimination format. It would not be really fair to to Caruana if he loses this match and then he um, basically has no more chance in the tournament. So the first game uh, I'm going to show you is uh, with Aronian having the white pieces and he opens with 1e4. Caruana replies with 1e5 and they quickly go straight into an Italian game. Of course a very popular opening at this level at all levels uh, really h3, d6, c3, all standard. a5 is a typical move to prevent some expansion with b4 by white. Rook e1, and they're just playing normal moves. And bishop b5 is uh, highlighting maybe one of the disadvantages of black's move a5, that the b5 square can now belong to white. Bishop to a7, knight f1, this typical maneuver, knight comes to f1 and then potentially to e3 or to g3 later on. Knight e7, knight g3, c6, kicking the bishop back. It's a very um, close to equal position. White can try to claim some slight advantage uh, because he had the first move, but it's generally okay for black. And here, Levant plays bishop to b3, which uh, was a new move. It's never been played before. Bishop c2 is uh, the most popular, for example, in the game Ferruccia versus Howell from the recent Grand Swiss. They uh, continued like this. Howell played a4, Ferruccia immediately advanced in the center, and then they reached this position, and black is fine, although uh, Howell later uh, went wrong and lost the game. But in this case, Levan prefers bishop to b3, and after a4, he trades these bishops. So we can consider the pluses and minuses of this. These doubled pawns for black are normally not that big a deal. They control some central squares. Um, but 
often if white immediately advances in the center, which is what he does, then we can see that if black takes on d4 and white recaptures, c takes, then white would be pretty happy. He can bring a rook to the c file. He can maybe think about um, advancing forward in the center. So black has to kind of decide what his game plan is here. He plays knight g6, uh, just keeping the tension, which is normally a good idea in these e4, e5 positions. You don't want to commit your pawns too soon. And the players play some normal moves until knight h5. And this move is um, a little surprising. It doesn't appear to, to do much rather than simply restraining black, and also provoking black, I would say. Uh, maybe black should simply continue with um, really a non-committal move. Queen e7 is flexible and useful. Um, but it tempted Fabi to play this move, knight f4, which I'm not going to say is a bad move, but it certainly gives white what he wants, and it almost justifies this move, knight h5. And the reasoning is he can now take this knight and force a recapture with the pawn and advance forward with e5. So the main worry I have for black in this position is this a7 bishop, which is out of the game. Um, for example, besides any other factor, uh, black would not want to play d5 here because, for multiple reasons, but mostly because that bishop on a7 is just terrible. So it's a little bit positionally risky for, for black. He has to also worry about his pawn on f4, which is cut out. And after queen e8, knight h4 was a very strong move by Levon. And these knights look a little weird, but there's no way to really um, effectively play against them. And if he has time to reorganize, then black's pieces are not coming to, to life the way that they should be. And if this bishop on a7 stays restrained and black's pawn weaknesses remain, then white will be very happy. So f3 is just an attempt to create some complications. You see that this knight on h5 is no longer defended, so we have to go back. And after d takes e5, knight takes f3, we reach sort of a, a pivotal moment. So the most natural move is to respond to the threat on the e5 pawn and just take here. But now white can respond with two recaptures, and I like both of them. I don't know what exactly Levon intended, but let's just say for simplicity's sake he takes with the c pawn. We can see that black has these pawn weaknesses on c6 and e6, and white's play is very simple. He can bring his rooks to the files and target those pawns. It's not terrible for black, but it's not uh, very pleasant either, and he would just have to defend uh, passively. So, rather than play the obvious way, Fabiano played queen f7, which is essentially a pawn sacrifice. After d takes e5, knight b6, he's arguing that it's worth giving away this pawn, because now he can bring his knight to d5, his bishop on a7 has a, knight a nice diagonal, he can play on the f file, he can bring a rook to d8, a knight to f4. Basically, he's saying that activity is more important than material. Knight to e4, um, Levon sees the square on d6, which potentially could be nice for his knight. Knight comes to d5, that was expected. a3, which is a useful move to prevent perhaps any a3 by black. Black might want to play that move, and he could have played it maybe on the previous move, but now it's no longer an option. And now Fabi makes a pretty large mistake by playing c5. The best move would have been knight f4 with just concrete ideas in mind. First he has ideas of playing rook a d8, forcing the queen away, and then knight takes h3 or knight takes g2. But what really matters is what happens after knight d4, which is uh, logical, blocking the bishop's diagonal and getting the knight off of that sort of shaky square on f3. Now comes rook a d8, knight to d6, and queen g6. And there's this mate threat on g2, and there's no good way for white to defend it without conceding something. The choice is queen f3 or queen g4. And just as an example, let's say queen g4, which looks like it's nice trading queens into an endgame. Black can take and play knight d3. This is the key point, and without this, black would be in some trouble. But with this tactical resource, knight takes e5, he is... Um, undermining the protection of the knight on d6, and black should be within a holding range here. 
So there are some other lines to calculate, but the main idea is that Black's counterplay comes just in time before White can completely stabilize and take over the game. So uh, after c5, which was Fabi's choice, he wants to advance his pawn to c4 and create this uh, really nice grip, potentially getting a knight to d3, but it's a little slow because White comes in with his own knight. Queen g6, um, knight h4, um, you should be careful not to allow too much counterplay by black, like knight f4 or something. So knight h4 is a nice move, queen g5, and queen g4. Aronian doesn't want to deal with any of these um, kingside attacks by black, so he just goes straight forward and wants to um, trade queens, so he's never made it. They trade, and c4. Again, uh, this is the whole idea. Now f2 is threatened, knight comes back, rook f4. So he's bringing his rook into the game, he might double on the f-file, he might take on uh, g4, he's just playing actively. So knight takes b5, rook takes g4, king f1. This is a very nice move by Levon, and the point would be revealed if Fabi blundered with knight f4. This did not happen, but this shows the idea that white has. Levon would have taken and played rook e4, and the fact that the white king on f1 is not within checking range of the black knight is what gives white a winning position here. If the king was on g1, black could play knight h3 check. So that's why this king on f1 is very nicely placed. But that did not happen. Uh, Fabi saw it. He played h5 to defend his rook in some cases of knight f4, rook e4. Uh, but also, we'll see in a second that this has another idea, and this h-pawn can be used to undermine uh, white's uh, pawn structure. So bishop c5, knight comes back to d4. We see that, that white is up a pawn here, but in reality, it's not so easy to win the game. White should definitely be better, but he still doesn't have an easy way to play considering that black has a lot of activity here. That's the whole point of this position for black. You need activity. So knight f4, g3, knight to d3, and Levon saw this coming and he prepared a very practical solution. He decides to just sacrifice the exchange back and get uh, another pawn on e6 and probably another pawn on d3. That pawn is very weak and will probably fall. If he manages to get that third pawn on d3, he will have three pawns for the exchange and he will be very happy. So black needs to act quickly to prevent uh, white from getting this ideal scenario in which he would win this pawn on d3. So bishop to e7, rook d1, attacking this pawn, and here h4 was not played but it would have been a nice idea. The point is that we're pitching this pawn away temporarily but rook b8, and now if rook to d2, then bishop takes a3, and there's some very nice tactics there, because if white takes, then rook b1 check, and it's bad news for white. That's why this h4, g takes h4, would have uh, been very useful for black. Uh, white can also take rook takes d3, but in some lines, like this one, it's nice to have bishop takes h4 as an option. It's very complicated stuff, I don't want to go too deep into it, and I don't blame uh, Fabiana for not playing that. Instead he plays king f7, but this turns out a bit slow, because the knight can come back to really a square it wants to be on anyway. Other knight goes to d4. You can notice how these knights are all protected by pawns. It's very useful if a knight has an outpost where it's solidly protected. So h4 finally comes, rook takes d3, h takes, and rook f3. A very nice move by Aronian, basically consolidating his position. He wants to take the pawn on g3, but he also wants to threaten a discovery with this knight, and Fabiano decides that his best chance is to go straight into some tactics here. So he takes on f2, he's not fearing this discovery, um, he doesn't fear knight e6, or maybe he did fear it and thought he had to go for it anyway. Uh, King e8, knight takes d8, because he has an idea here. He doesn't want to just recapture the knight and lose his f2 pawn and be down two pawns for nothing. He's uh, threatening mate in one here with bishop to h4. So now is the moment that Levon gave away the win, and it's not uh, so easy to see to the end, but if he found the first two moves, then it would have been straightforward from there, because then his plan would have been very uh, evident. So the winning move is knight e2, basically preventing rook g1, which I think I said a second ago is mate. It's not mate, but he wants to queen the pawn. <laughs> he wants to play rook g1 check and rook e1. So he's stopping that, and... After king takes d8, he trades rooks, 
But not with rook f4. He wants to play rook d3 and king e7, rook d4. So this would have been the way for Levant to win the game. The idea is black is forced to not only trade rooks, but to improve white's pawn structure. And white's connected pass pawns are very nice here because the knight comes to c3, preventing the king from invading on d5. It's still not completely easy to see from afar that this is winning, but if the players had gotten here, then uh, certainly Levon would have found the way. Let's say black plays a passing move like g6 with the idea to come in with the king. White can play a useful move b4 to prepare the knight coming to c5. If king takes d4, e6, king d5, knight c5, the knight lands on the square, uh, and the e6 pawn is protected, and everything is secure for white, and he will eventually march his pawns up and win the game. Not easy to see from afar, but uh, Levon could have let the situation arise, and then once he got to that point, he surely would have found the win. However, he instead um, couldn't calculate that to the end, so he probably got a little nervous. He saw his clock was dwindling down, so he plays knight 8 to e6, allowing this. Rook e1, king d3, and perhaps he thought that Fabi would play f1 queen, allow rook takes, and then knight takes g7 check, and he would still have three pawns for the exchange, but perhaps he missed that g6, uh, he can actually keep the pawn because he can play f1 queen next move. And if black is allowed to do that, then it could even become dangerous for white because black's g pawn would still be living and it would become a three result game and there's no good way to get rid of this g pawn uh, in due time. So for that reason, Levon starts to repeat the position. He plays knight c7, king d8, knight e6. And note that Fabi can't really avoid this if he plays his king to the wrong square, like d7, then at the very least white can play rook takes f2 and then knight f8 check and take this g6 pawn. So he goes back to e8, which is the best square. There's no really useful checks for white here. He can keep going back to c7, but king d8, and the players just repeated like this and made a draw. So uh, Aronian was surely very upset with himself after that game because he was very close to winning. If he saw this um, line to the end with rook d3, rook d4, he would have won the game, but it was just too difficult to evaluate from afar. And Fabi defended well, and he made the best use of his chances, so full credit to him for saving this game. So that means that we go on to the next one, in which Fabiano gets his try with the white pieces. If he wins this game, then it's over, then he wins the match. So he definitely wants to put some pressure on. So he opens with 1c4, the English. Levon replies with knight f6, knight c3, and e5. Knight f3 knight c6, g3, a very classical four knights um, English, I guess you would call it, and then g3 is one of the, or probably the most popular way to play. And knight d4, and this is setting a slight trap, it's not really a trap at this level, but the point is that if knight takes e5, queen e7, and if you play like knight d3, then knight f3 is a pretty shocking mate. <laughs> so that means white would have to play f4 here and the position is not good after black plays to d6. It's just bad for white. Of course, uh, that would never happen. So after bishop g2, the point is you just traded off uh, a piece for black. You can argue whether it's worth it. He now freed up maybe the c pawn to play c6 and d5 if he wants. And he simplified the position, but he did spend a few tempi to do that. He moved his knight like three times. so. This line is not seen that often uh, for black, but it's a perfectly solid and decent way of playing. So bishop c5, d3, castle, castle, a5, a very useful move. In general, um, it's very similar to the last game, actually, in the Italian, where a5 is played. Whenever you see a move like this, it's normally to prevent an expansion by white. White could often consider playing a3 or rook b1 and following it up with b4. So a5 is just a measure against that. Bishop g2, just returning the bishop home. c6, potentially insinuating uh, that black wants to play d5 in one go. Fabi plays bishop to d2. d6, he says no, I want to put it on d6, not d5. a3, bishop to e6. Queen c2. As is typical in this position, they're kind of playing these cagey developing moves. 
it's not completely apparent which direction the game is going to go in, so the players are choosing moves that will be useful in any case. The queen will always be better on c2 than on d1. The bishop for black will always be better on e6 than c8. So these are moves you can play with full confidence, knowing that you're certainly not harming your position in any way, and then once the game develops further, you can decide more concretely on what plan you want to uh, choose. So h6, knight a4. Now the game uh, takes on a slightly different character because Karana goes straight forward with bishop a7, c5. So it's funny that just like in the last game, white is playing against this a7 bishop, shutting it out of the game. But unlike in the last game, here black very freely gives it away. So why is this um, a decent way of playing for black? Well, normally you don't want to give up the bishop pair for no reason, but black's position is very solid and secure, and this bishop on g2, while it's often impressive in these types of positions, it's kind of blunted. Black has this pawn on c6, which more or less shuts it down completely. And for white to make it useful, he'll have to spend some time playing something like b4, b5, but before that happens, black will have something to do. And he does it right now. It's bishop to d5. So what this does is it poses a little bit of an annoying question for white. He can uh, trade the bishop away, which he doesn't really want to do because the bishop pair is one of his main assets. Or he can play the way he did with f3, which keeps the bishop, but it blocks it in. And it's going to be a while before it can come back into the game, either through h3 or through f1 later on or um, maybe some other way if the game opens up. So uh, white is happy to keep the bishop pair, but not entirely happy with having to play a move like f3. So a4 is played, which is just clamping down on this queen side, preventing any b4 ideas like I was mentioning a moment ago. e4, uh, it looks like if you retreat the bishop, then queen takes e5, but there's this intermediate move, knight d7, queen goes back, bishop comes to b3, and this bishop has an outpost on b3, just preventing any rook d1 in case the game opens up. White is going to have a tough time getting a rook to the d-file. So he plays f4. Uh, he wants to open the position. He has the bishop here. He wants his pieces to come to life. So here, uh, Levant plays the move queen b6, but I want to quickly examine the move c5, which the idea is to clamp down on d4 for good, but it's not that easy to evaluate this position, I would say, at least uh, in my opinion, because white has a couple of approaches he can take. He can either um, go forward in the center or go forward on the king side. Going forward in the center would involve taking on e5 at some moment, but black can basically always respond with knight takes e5 and be happy. But what I would consider is building up with white and then going to the king side. He can start with like rook f2, rook af1, and then there's this plan with playing like f5, closing the center like that, and then playing g4, and then h4 if possible, and g5, and just going forward on the king side. It's a slow burning attack, and black should have resources to defend against it, but it could look a little scary. So queen b6, while maybe a human move, is objectively not the best, because trading queens means that black is not going to worry about being attacked, but it also means that he's going to have to have a slightly worse endgame here. Because white now has complete freedom with his bishop pair. He can um, really do as he pleases. Uh, black's position has no weaknesses, but it also doesn't have a lot of active potential either. Whereas white does, because if the position open, opens up, then the bishops will start to dominate. So that's one of the key ideas in chess, is who has more potential as as the game goes on. And in this position, it's white. So long term, white should be happy. So rook ac1, rook d8, rook f3, defending the d-pawn. The d-pawn is the only thing you could possibly claim as a weakness for white, but it's very easy to defend, so no matter. Knight comes back to d7, bishop to h3. This is sort of hinting at the possibility of taking on d7 and taking on e5, which would uh, be uh, a pawn for white. You can say that maybe you want to find the right moment to do that and not do it immediately because it's opposite colored bishops. But basically it's an idea um, for the moves to come, which is why Aronian doesn't want to see any of it. He just trades it off immediately. 
So white no longer has a bishop pair. Uh, that means that his advantage is gone, right? Uh, no, not in this case. It's true, his bishop pair is gone, but he still has um, a bishop versus knight, which is an advantage in endgames uh, with pawns on both sides of the board. And more importantly, I would say his kingside slash center pawns. I don't really know how to um, define this, but his pawns that stretch from h3 to d3, those five pawns versus black's four pawns, particularly the doubled pawns, they're going to come into play for sure because if black ever trades on f4, white can recapture with the pawn. He will have some files to work with. He can shove his pawns forward. His rook will uh, get to the um, open files and it's just not easy to defend for black here. So, um, king comes forward. Of course, in the end game, you want to activate your king. c5, king e2, b6. Levance is playing solid moves, but he's also putting his pawns in dark squares. So that should be done with caution, I would say. Bishop c3, rook c8, and now you'll see for a few moves that this pawn on e5 can be taken. But that would sort of block up the position. White would still be better, but black would then... Uh, for example, if f takes e5, he'll bring his knight to b8 to c6 to d4. And by waiting, white ensures that that will never happen. Because if white just keeps the position as it is, if black plays knight b8, white will play bishop takes e5, which is obviously a huge improvement. So it's clever to not commit too soon for white. That pawn is not going away because uh, he won't take on f4 and open up the bishop. So rook f to f1, rook f8 king to e3, rook to c7. But now is the right moment. This is the thing in chess. Often the idea is present for a few moves and the idea is clear, but the key is finding the right moment and the right method to execute it because there's details that matter. So why does it work here? Well, basically the king on e3 is better than it was a few moves ago on e2. After d4, takes takes. If the king was still on e2, then rook c2 check would come with tempo, and that would be a, an improvement for black. So, uh, by waiting for the right moment, he's ensured that he'll gain some tempi, because rook c2 is not a check, and he can just um, continue by bringing his rook to the d file. And after knight c6, he doesn't want to take on b6 and leave his pawn on b2 hung out to dry. He plays bishop c3. He doesn't need the b6 pawn. He wants to bring his rook to d6. He wants to invade and he wants to get rid of the e-pawn and then advance his own e-pawns. He has two of them, so that's better than one. <laughs> rook takes h2, rook d6, knight a5, king f3, he's not going to play rook takes b6, knight c4 check, king f7, and rook takes b6. Um, note that this knight on a5 is terrible. It has no secure square. It could go to b3, which is a secure square, um, but it doesn't do anything there. So knight comes to c4, trying to pressure the white queenside pawns. Rook b7 check, king e8. Uh, if if king g6, then uh, probably white would play rook to e7, attacking the e, e6 pawn. So he prefers to give this pawn up. Knight takes b2. And white is up a pawn, but what matters more is the activity of his pieces. You can compare that Black's king is stuck on the back rank, and White's rook is really dominant there. And that if he ever wins the e6 pawn, which, spoiler, he will in a couple of moves, then Black is not really positioned to fight against the past e pawn. So this is uh, quite bad for Black. So Karana plays bishop b4. Very straightforward threat. He wants rook e7 check. King d8, rook e7. Knight c4. And rook takes e6. So all that uh, Fabiano needs to do is get these pawns going and he'll be in very good shape. So h5, bishop to d6, uh, bringing the bishop in. It's very useful how the white bishop and pawn defend each other. It's a very nice construction to have in an endgame like this. h4, he's trying to trade off um, as many pawns as possible to try to bring himself closer to a draw but it just doesn't come in time. After rook g6, rook h3, he's close to maybe trading the rooks off, in which case then um, white would not have the necessary firepower to 
um, convert the game into a win, possibly. But it just doesn't happen here because after check on g8, check on g7, rook to c7. The point is not really about maintaining this g-pawn. He can give it away as long as he has calculated a way to force his own pawn through. And the difference between the bishop and the knight is clear. If the knight just goes away somewhere, then let's say, I don't know, knight b2. It's a terrible move that no one would ever play, but just to illustrate, then white would play e6, and then rook c8 mate is coming. But if he ever takes on d6, then that undoubles white's pawns with e takes, and then the pawns are just going to go forward. So there's no satisfactory solution for black here. He takes first, king f4, he takes because there's nothing better, but now the pawns are just going to run through, they've been undoubled, and black's h-pawn is not going to be enough to save the day. He goes rook takes uh, a3, king f5, also threatening king e6 by the way, and then rook c8. So rook g3 was played in order to meet king e6 with rook g6, but then uh, e5 came and in this position Aronian resigned because um, e6 is coming and then the rook and the pawns are very well known to coordinate well in a position like this where the pawns can both get to the 6th rank. I'll just show an example line to see what could have happened if Aronian did not resign. He could have tried checking the king, king would come back to leave the path open for the e-pawn, and then he could start checking but the king would walk back and um, eventually the rook is going to deliver a mate on the 8th rank. So yeah, this game was pretty well conducted by both sides until they transitioned into this end game where Aronian didn't even make a clear mistake, I would say. Um, you can argue that along the way there were minor details, but in general, once we got to this position where it was the bishop against the knight and white had this nice pawn structure, then Caruana was able to convert it pretty smoothly. It didn't ever seem at any moment as if black's counterplay would be sufficient to uh, create enough headaches for white to prevent him from following his own plan of invading with his rook and using his pawn, pawn majority and coordinating with his bishop to attack all the pawns. So um, it's, it's always strange to analyze a game where uh, it's not easy to pinpoint a critical moment or a moment where the game clearly started to drift away, but I think that it was an example of one player getting a very pleasant endgame, a slightly better endgame objectively, and just pushing it all the way to a win. So with this victory, uh, Caruana won the match, and as I mentioned before, this also means he wins the tournament because he did not lose a single match uh, the whole time. He won all of his um, matches in the main bracket, and that means that he um, he's the champion of the American Cup. So uh, I can't speak for everyone, but I know personally I really enjoyed watching this tournament. I thought the format was fantastic. I really, really hope that they continue to implement uh, these novel ideas that haven't been tried a whole lot, like this double elimination knockout, this sudden death time control with no extra time on move 40. It just made for some fantastically exciting chess especially in the Rapid, also the playoffs. Uh, some matches went to Armageddon's that were pretty insane, so uh, they really brought out all the stops for this event, and as always, the St. Louis Chess Club does a great job um, putting on a show there. So congrats to Karana for winning, for Aronian for f finishing second, and to all the players for putting on a fantastic event. I hope it comes back next year. I look forward to it. And until then... Uh, Let's look forward to the candidates, I guess. That's probably the next main event that we are going to um, have in the chess world. Maybe some others before that, but candidates is going to be the big one. So see you next time. Thanks. Bye.